Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Pleasure is ours. I thought I would just jump in by talking about LinkedIn as a product that people in this room, I'm sure, use often. Well, let's, uh, let's test that thesis. How many folks here have a LinkedIn profile? Show of hands. Oh, very nice. Okay. That's good. Good representation. Off to a good start. I'm sure you enjoyed that ego boost right there. Uh, so what specifically do users get out of LinkedIn in your mind? So I think uh, above all else, it's the ability to connect to opportunity. And opportunity can be defined by the individual member. Some people may think of that as getting a job, getting your first job coming out of school, getting an internship, apprenticeship. Uh, entrepreneurs raise financing. Investors uh, find startups. Salespeople find prospects. Uh, you see people finding mentors. Uh, they are able to ask for advice. So it, it runs the gamut. I think above all else, it's this uh, ability to connect to opportunity. Mm. And looking at it from the other side, even more powerful, and I believe a, an important revenue source for you, is the use of LinkedIn for recruiters. Mm. Can you explain what it looks like from that side? Yeah, that's, that's the uh, other end of the marketplace. And we do think of LinkedIn uh, in certain terms as uh, a platform with a number of different enterprise applications. And if you were to double click on any one of those experiences, they're essentially marketplaces. So you just identified one of, uh, if not the largest business for us, uh, what we call talent solutions. And you have uh, individuals, members who are looking for jobs, and you have recruiters and hiring managers who are looking to identify uh, the best prospect that they can find. Uh, similarly, marketers use LinkedIn to engage with their audience. Uh, in particular, uh, with regard to uh, business to business opportunities, they're trying to identify decision makers, uh, high consideration purchases for consumers. Uh, I mentioned the, the sales scenario. Uh, we also have uh, a learning uh, marketplace, if you will, uh, where you have folks who are offering coursework. We call them authors. And we have uh, millions upon millions of folks who are interested in taking these courses. So you have multiple marketplaces within this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And if we maybe zoom out a little bit on how LinkedIn fits into the broader job market, how do you think the process of finding a job, say for someone like us, has changed over, say, 20 years? Well, I'd start with what hasn't changed. And what hasn't changed is the importance of your network and the importance of knowing people who can potentially help you, open doors, provide recommendations, referrals, uh, make sure that you know of opportunities that may be uh, interesting to you and relevant to you. So that's one of the things that has not changed. If anything, by virtue of a network like LinkedIn, it's even more important. Uh, but one of the things that has changed is this scalable opportunity, this digital opportunity, where we can take these relationships and connections between people and start to create value at a scale that's pretty much unprecedented. You know, we've got 645 million people who've signed up uh, to LinkedIn. And uh, the ability for a recruiter, by way of example, to be able to search across that entire pool on a global basis is, is unprecedented. Mm. Mm. So, kind of taking that on an abstract level, you've talked about your ambition to use LinkedIn to create what you've called an economic graph. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you remember this. And it, the idea oh, is I it, remember. It I, I better remember. <laughs> Can ex explain that for us, please. <laughs> uh, economic graph. So, let's take a step back. Uh, at LinkedIn, we have both uh, a vision and a mission. We delineate between the two. The vision is the, the dream. It's true north. It was originally designed to inspire our employees. Uh, the mission is a singular overarching objective that uh, we see as measurable, realizable, and hopefully inspirational. Uh, the mission is to connect the world's professionals, to make them more productive and successful. That's targeting knowledge workers, and that's the, you know, the, the lion's share of the 645 million people are concentrated within that segment, although we are increasingly broadening beyond that. The vision, the dream, is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. That's not just knowledge workers. There's nearly three and a half billion people in the global workforce. We want to create opportunity for all of them. So the way in which we're going to operationalize this vision is through developing the world's first economic graph. So graph is kind of a fancy way of talking about a network or connecting nodes. And historically, LinkedIn really created a, a professional graph. And we've been talking about that thus far. We facilitated connections between professionals. The economic graph would digitally map the global economy across six different pillars or dimensions. Uh, the first of those is uh, we expect there to be a profile for every member of the global workforce. So all three and a half billion people in the global workforce. Second, we want to have a profile for every company in the world. And when you include small, medium-sized businesses, there's north of 60 million companies in the world. 
Uh, we'd also like there to be a digital representation for every job made available by those companies. Uh, today we have over 20 million available jobs that are digitally accessible on LinkedIn. Uh, the fourth pillar is to have a digital representation for every skill required to obtain the jobs offered by those companies to those members. And uh, this started as a taxonomy and, and standardizing across tens of thousands of skills. And then we acquired a company called Linda several years ago. So we became a principal in terms of offering the actual coursework required to obtain the skill. And that brings me to the fifth pillar which is a digital representation for every vocational training facility, junior college, four-year university that facilitates the way in which people can acquire the skills they need to obtain those opportunities. And then the last, the sixth pillar, is a publishing platform that enables every individual, every company, every university to share their professionally relevant knowledge if they're interested in doing so. And then we allow for capital, all forms of capital, intellectual capital, working capital, of course, human capital, to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, we're helping to lift and transform the global economy. Are there any moments that you've observed, stories you've heard, or kind of connections that you've seen made that make you think, oh, that's, that's why we have LinkedIn. That, that's what makes it so valuable. I, literally countless. And I'm in this very fortuitous position where I'm on the receiving end of a lot of those stories. Uh, uh, you know, our membership is uh, not shy when it comes to uh, voicing their opinions, sharing their experiences. They do it in the feed. They send what we call in-mail, which is the ability to private message somebody on LinkedIn. And uh, the thank you notes that I get, that our customer service team gets, that our individual employees get, uh, the stories of uh, absolute transformation, uh, where people's career trajectories are forever altered, their lives are changed. Uh, they're in a position where they can take care of themselves, they can take care of their families, they can take care of the people that they love and, and, and care about. They can create opportunities for other people. Uh, it, it's one of, if not the most important reasons we do what we do. Mm. And let's say from, from all of our perspective, what, what are the tips you would have for our LinkedIn profiles? For your LinkedIn, we're getting very practical here, aren't we? Uh, okay, so let's see. So virtually everyone raised their hand when it came to having a LinkedIn profile. How many of you all with a LinkedIn profile have an image of yourselves on your profile? Show hands. Okay, pretty much everyone. So that's tip number one. So the image, though it seems like a, a fairly simple thing to do, changes everything. Uh, and it's uh, in intuitive and, and somewhat less intuitive ways. Intuitively, when people can see who you are, they're gonna feel a stronger sense of connection. But interestingly enough, when an individual uploads an image of themselves, they're more engaged on LinkedIn because now it better represents who they are. So they take it more seriously. They're willing to invest more time and energy and effort. So that's interesting. Uh, you want to complete, certainly complete your descriptions for any uh, jobs that you've had. You don't just want to put the title and the company up there. You want to try to provide some kind of context in terms of the work that you've done. You want to add skills. Make sure people understand the skills that you've uh, amassed over time. Uh, I would make sure to complete your objective. Uh, at or near the top so people can jump straight to what it is that you're trying to accomplish and how you want to accomplish it. Uh, a summary can be very helpful. Uh, so I think those are some of the most important things. Also, you got to continue to build out that network. So when you meet people that you're interested in working with, when you meet people that you think you can benefit from uh, a, a learning relationship or someone that you believe can create an opportunity, someone that you believe you can create an opportunity for, these are the kinds of individuals that you should be adding to your network. And then lastly, once you've got that profile completed, it's about sharing what you know. It's about sharing your perspective, sharing your experience, sharing what you've learned, sharing what inspires you. And oftentimes I get asked, where do you start and how do you know what to share? And the, the answer is fairly straightforward and it's just be authentic. Don't try to be someone that you're not. Don't try to be someone that you think people expect you to be. Be yourself and share the things that you're most excited about. Share the things that move you. Share the things that have really opened your eyes. And you'll find that you're able to engage an audience very quickly doing that. I think a lot of us would you know, put up all that information on our LinkedIn, all of our old jobs. And then we would kind of do the job hunt for after university, kind of parallel to LinkedIn, not really interacting with it. Mm -hmm. Can it be integrated into finding jobs after university? Yeah, I would argue that that's you know, probably the number one uh, value proposition that we offer our members is the ability to find a job. I mentioned uh, at the onset when we were talking about the economic graph, 
there are now over 20 million jobs that you can find on LinkedIn. And you've got uh, you know, countless companies who are using LinkedIn as a primary mechanism to recruit. So you want to make sure that you're present, you want to make sure that you're engaged, you want to make sure people understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish, and you want to find those opportunities and pursue them proactively. Mm. What made you want to join LinkedIn in the first place? What made me want to join LinkedIn? So a little backstory. So I had been at Yahoo prior to joining LinkedIn, and I was there for roughly seven years. I ended up leaving right around the time my wife and I had our first baby, our daughter. And uh, I took some time off on paternity leave, and I, I didn't go back. Uh, I stayed uh, out, of, uh, out of the day-to-day -day, uh, work life for some period of time, a few months, and then uh, I started up again as uh, an executive in residence at two venture capital firms, simultaneously Greylock and Excel. And Greylock was an early stage investor in LinkedIn, and the founder, a guy named Reed Hoffman, who actually attended Oxford, uh, but Re did you guys know that? that Reed, the founder of LinkedIn, uh, attended, yeah? Uh, no, I don't think it was the business school. He studied philosophy. So, and it, it worked out pretty well for him. It worked, it worked out pretty well for him. So, um, at any rate, uh, Reed had decided that they were going to make a transition with their uh, current CEO. And uh, the uh, firm asked me if I was interested in helping out. And I thought that was part of the role as an exec executive in residence. And I thought I would continue to do that while working at Greylock. And I ended up showing up uh, at Reed's house. And uh, he sat me down in a LinkedIn-style beanbag chair that had a lot of in-words all over it, inspire, innovate, stuff like that. And he said, I have a list here, uh, two lists actually, one for full-time CEOs, the other for interim CEOs. You're, you're the only name on both lists. What do you say? And I was like, wait a minute. What just happened? I thought I was going to be like, helping you out as part of Greylock. And he said, no, no, I don't know what they told you, but the, the help we need is for someone to, to step in and, and, and take a leadership role. We spent, in, in Reed's uh, estimation, uh, we spent roughly 30 hours together over the next several weeks. This is uh, not a job interview. This was relationship building. And one of the primary reasons I decided to join LinkedIn was because of Reed. He's uh, brilliant. And oftentimes, you hear the term visionary bandied about. It gets uh, a bit overused now. He's a true visionary. And he's also as, as good a person, as high integrity, as he is intelligent and, and forward thinking. So that was a big reason uh, I wanted to get involved, was to have the opportunity to work with him on fulfilling that initial founding vision that he had. I had the opportunity to meet the team. And I was extremely impressed with the talent that had been amassed already. Uh, when I joined, in, uh, it was December of 2008, there were 338 employees. And I had the opportunity in those early days to, to meet virtually everybody. Uh, but perhaps above all else, it was the potential of the platform. And even then, I had a sense that um, for all the value that had been created thus far to date by virtue of this professional graph, that something even bigger was potentially possible, something like the economic graph. So it was for those reasons. Uh, in terms of the vision and the potential for LinkedIn, one of the decisions you're most known for is the acquisition by Microsoft in 2016. Uh, what, 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 made you, what made you sell? Well, there's what made us sell and what made us sell to Microsoft. Uh, in terms of uh, selling, uh, scale uh, was important consideration for us. Uh, the opportunity to fulfill this vision uh, that we are in pursuit of uh, we believed scale uh, would help to accelerate uh, the realization of that vision. We also didn't want to be in a position uh, during uh, economic downturns where we wouldn't be able to invest at a time when arguably our members and our customers need us most. Uh, and we saw that uh, during the last economic downturn uh, around 2008 and 2009. Uh, so those were a, a couple of the considerations. In terms of Microsoft specifically, it came down to really two dimensions that Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, and I discussed prior to doing the transaction. And we both agreed that uh, for it to make sense, we would need to have alignment in terms of our sense of purpose and in terms of structure. And with regard to purpose, uh, unbeknownst to me, Satya, when he took over as CEO uh, several years ago, had sat down with the leadership team and uh, essentially come up with a new mission statement for Microsoft that historically, uh, under Bill Gates and then Steve Ballmer was about putting a computer on every desktop, which I think they helped realize and certainly helped accelerate that. And uh, with Satya and the new leadership team, it was empowering every individual and organization on the planet to achieve more. 
And that sounded an awful lot like that mission statement that I mentioned earlier, connecting the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. We used different words, but underlying those two statements was uh, a lot of alignment in terms of our sense of purpose. Satya is very purpose-driven. We're very purpose-driven at LinkedIn. So there was strong alignment there. Uh, this, the similar sense of purpose, too, we were coming at it from two different perspectives, Microsoft through enterprise software and increasingly the cloud, LinkedIn through the network. So very complementary assets. In terms of structure, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what he was thinking. Was he going to you know, ask us to move headquarters up to Redmond, where Microsoft was headquartered? Uh, was I going to end up reporting into an existing division or subsidiary? And he said he had been given in a lot of thought, and he had concluded that the best way to do this acquisition would be for LinkedIn to remain independent. And he had me at independent. I was basically, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. So the opportunity for LinkedIn to be part of something at that kind of scale, Microsoft has grown into the most valuable company in the world, but has a footprint of north of a billion individuals using their products and services on a global basis. And then extraordinary access to technology, to infrastructure, to talent. Uh, so, in, in that sense, uh, it made a lot of, it, it really worked. And uh, the opportunity to continue to control our own destiny and continue to pursue our mission, our vision, our culture, our values, to do it with the same team that we had developed, that was very appealing. Mm -hmm. And aside from the corporate elements of the, of the merger, the, the product itself, were there opportunities there for, for improving LinkedIn? Yeah, and, and we've taken advantage of some of those opportunities. Uh, in particular, by way of example, uh, if you uh, look at a product like Outlook, uh, you now have the opportunity to see who's uh, emailing you by virtue of uh, integration of the LinkedIn profile. We can go much deeper with that across the entire office suite of applications. Uh, we have a, a SKU that Microsoft offers uh, as part of their dynamic CRM uh, that integrates our sales solutions uh, solution uh, we recently announced we're going to be transitioning over to Azure in the cloud, which is a, a huge infrastructural transition for us, and uh, our technology team is incredibly excited about that. Uh, we're exploring some opportunities with regard to uh, packaging our learning offering uh, in some of Microsoft's uh, enterprise application offerings. Uh, going forward, two of the uh, opportunities that I think are going to be most exciting uh, one is uh, an initiative we refer to as close colleagues. <clears throat> and it turns out when we can identify who you work most closely with within an organization, and we can recommend or facilitate you adding them to your network and connecting with them, it creates an enormous amount of value for that team within the, the organization. Uh, and the more connected organizations are on LinkedIn, the more they can take advantage of some of those value props we were talking about earlier, the way they recruit, the way they market, the way they learn, uh, the way they sell. Uh, so this ability to essentially leverage, uh, we talked about LinkedIn as a professional graph, increasingly an economic graph. Microsoft uh, has really developed a, a, a corporate graph by virtue of those enterprise applications. And so the ability to leverage Microsoft's corporate graph and gain real insight into who you work most closely with, uh, subject to you opting into that, of course. You know, our, our foundational to the LinkedIn experience is that our members come first, and trust is absolutely paramount to both LinkedIn and Microsoft. So uh, close colleagues is one thing we're very, very excited about. Uh, the other is to enable Microsoft customers uh, to leverage an Azure instance of LinkedIn's graph, where they can conflate uh, the, the customer's data and the customer's proprietary applications uh, with LinkedIn information uh, that's relevant to their employees. And that can also unlock a lot of value as well. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to a, a whole different area. Anyone who knows you will know that you're a huge advocate for compassionate management. Mm -hmm. now, what is that? What is compassionate management? It's managing compassionately. You know, short answer. So uh, when I was uh, about 30, I read a book called The Art of Happiness. Anyone here familiar with that book, Art of Happiness? Not as many hands as the, the LinkedIn uh, membership. So I, I don't think a single hand went up. I can't recommend this book uh, strongly enough. It's the teachings of the Dalai Lama, as told uh, to his author, Howard Cutler, who was an interpreter for the Dalai Lama and traveled with him. Uh, for a number of years, and uh, when the Dalai Lama would come off stage, he does a lot of public speaking, uh, he would ask follow-up questions based on some of the things the Dalai Lama had discussed, and he started keeping rigorous notes 
and uh, after a while he realized he probably had the answers to a number of questions that uh, millions of people all over the world would want to ask the Dalai Lama, so he asked for permission to write this book. And that's The Art of Happiness. <clears throat> and it was in this book that I learned for the first time at 30 years old the meaning of compassion and the difference between compassion and empathy. And like a lot of people, especially in Western society, I had a tendency to use empathy and compassion synonymously, interchangeably. Fundamental difference between the two. Empathy is feeling what another living thing feels. Compassion is putting yourself in the shoes of another person, seeing the world through their lens for the sake of alleviating their suffering. Put another way, compassion is empathy plus action. Empathy is a means to that end, but it's not enough in and of itself. And a lot of people oftentimes talk about what a wonderful quality empathy is. Empathy can actually be quite problematic if you don't maintain enough distance between you and the other person. And I'll give you an example and an illustration that was in the book that forever changed my worldview on this. <clears throat> the Dalai Lama talked about walking along a mountainous trail and coming along somebody who was suffocating with a boulder on their chest. The empathetic response would be to feel the same sense of crushing suffocation, which would render you helpless, just like the individual. The compassionate response would be to recognize that that person is suffering, that they can't breathe, perhaps drawing upon an experience that you had where you can feel empathy and you can feel that suffocation, but then acting upon it and doing everything within your power to remove the boulder from their chest. So I learned that when I was 30. To this day, that book remains on my nightstand. That is a true story. There's only two possessions that are still on my nightstand. The AM FM clock radio I received when I was 13 years old and that book. And it just had great meaning to me. And applied in a business setting, you think, and it's at school as well, you think about all the interactions you have with other individuals, and you think about all the friction that's generated. And it happens, it's natural. People have differing perspectives, differing opinions. We typically take an egocentric view of the world. We see the world through our own lens. We see the world through the prism of our own perspectives and experiences, and we do that to protect ourselves to learn from mistakes and build upon successes. But when you do that in a situation where you're experiencing friction with another person, when you disagree, when there's anger on both sides, you typically have a tendency to assume the other person's doing something wrong. Perhaps they have nefarious intention. And they oftentimes don't. It's not necessarily political or territorial. They're not trying to undermine you or hurt you. If you can become a spectator to your own thoughts in that moment, recognize why there's friction, why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. Put yourself in the shoes of the other person and then ask why they've become triggered and why they're emotional in that moment. You can actually de-escalate the situation. You can remind the other person that more often than not you have a similar objective, particularly in a business setting. That's why you're in the meeting to begin with. You can ensure that that other person realizes that you're on their team, that you have their back, and you can work towards that mutual objective. And that can not only change the way you interact with that individual and interact with your team, it can change a company when that's compounded and scaled across hundreds if not thousands of people. And how does that work when you might not be on the same team, when, for instance, you have to fire someone? So one of the two most frequently asked questions I get is first and foremost, okay, this compassion thing sounds wonderful, I've started to practice it, and I find that it's really easy with people I care and like, but it's not so easy with the people I don't care and like. And uh, the point is, compassion is not conditional. It's actually most required in situations where you don't see eye to eye with the other person, where you're not necessarily on the same page. So that's the first most frequently asked question I get. The second is the one you just asked me, which is if you're gonna manage compassionately, how in the world would you ever fire anyone? How in the world would you ever have a difficult conversation with someone that's underperforming? And the answer is, one of the least compassionate things you can do for someone that's chronically underperforming and not capable of doing their job is to look the other way. Because what's happening in that situation? What's happening in that situation is that person is increasingly overwhelmed. They're starting to lose confidence. They're losing their sense of self. They're losing self-esteem. Their team sees this. It undermines their ability to manage the people they're responsible for. That same team then looks at you and questions why you're doing what you're doing. Why aren't you taking action? They know what's going on. And then worst of all, that individual who's losing their sense of self is bringing that same energy home with them. The most compassionate thing you can do when someone's underperforming is to sit down with that person 
and to have a very open, honest, and constructive discussion about the underperformance. The bar is set here. Here's the gap. I'm going to do everything with my, my power to help you close that gap. I'm going to coach you. I'm going to mentor you. You know, I, I hired you. I'm rooting for you. And we're going to work towards that end. And if for whatever reason we can't do that in a reasonable period of time, we're going to think about another role for you within the organization or potentially transition you to a role outside the company. That's how you manage compassionately in a situation like that. And in the way that you apply it to LinkedIn, every couple of weeks you run an all-hands meeting mm -hmm. with everyone in the company. How, how is that a manifestation of compassion management? I've never been asked that question. I get asked about managing compassionately. I get asked about the all hands. I've never been asked about the intersection between the two. It's a fantastic question. How is that an example of manifesting compassion? A few different thoughts come to mind. One, I, if I were an employee at a company, I would appreciate the leadership of that company coming up as frequently as possible and providing insight into how things were going as transparently as they could not sugarcoating things, not cheerleading, not just talking about what's working, but talking about what's not working as well. And that they, they treat the, the team, they treat all employees uh, as adults and as members of a team and uh, trust that team with that information. And that's something that has served our organization incredibly well over time. There's a, a very vicious cycle that comes with obfuscation and a very virtuous cycle that comes through transparency. Uh, with regard to obfuscation, you get on stage, you hold back certain information, people begin to resent that. And at some point, especially if they're diligent, they're going to find out that information, especially in the modern era. And if they find the information through their own means, what do you think they're going to do with it? They're not necessarily going to feel a sense of ownership over that information, and they may be more likely to leak it or share it with people who shouldn't be seeing that information. And then the senior leadership says, see, I told you we shouldn't share so much information. Now we've got to close ranks. We're going to have to share less and maybe even investigate who's doing this leaking. Very vicious cycle. The flip side to that is when you can be completely transparent, or as transparent as makes sense. And you bring everyone along and everyone on the same page, and you're cascading the same messages and the same objectives and reinforcing the same culture and the same values. And you're sharing what you're doing well. And more importantly, you're sharing what's not going well so that you can galvanize the entire company to get behind that effort. And uh, that's one example of compassion. It's putting yourself in the shoes of the audience and recognizing what works best for them. That's really interesting. Uh, I think we'll move to audience questions now. So put your hand up. Uh, I will select you. A microphone will come your way. Please stand up while you ask the question. Uh, let's go over here first. <clears throat> so, um, thank you very much for being here. As an entrepreneur, I've also found LinkedIn very useful. Mm. Um, my question to you is, given that in the labor market there still are many inequities and um, that there are still many groups that are systemically disadvantaged, mm. is there any evidence about what the impact of LinkedIn is on groups that have disadvantages in the labor market, um, where, where many uh, stereotypes still exist? against people of color, against women in leadership mm -hmm. roles and these kind of things. And beyond ev ev um, anecdotal evidence, is there also um, is there a measured impact and is there also an ambition of LinkedIn to have an impact in this powerful flow of human resources across the world? Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question. It's something we, we think a lot about at the company. In terms of measurable impact, I'll give you proxies for the impact. So. Just a quick straw poll. How, how many of you at any point uh, thus far in your life have ever leveraged a relationship to open a door for you uh, with regard to school, with regard to job, vocation, et cetera? How many? Um, I would definitely raise my hand. You got to get it up there. That's like a little half raise. <laughs> so um, for this group, I would estimate it's probably at least 60 to 70 percent. And my guess is if I ask that same question five to 10 years hence, that virtually every hand in the audience would go up. And it typically does when I'm talking to folks who are a little later on in their careers. So that's anecdotally the evidence. We, we know that people leverage relationships to, to find jobs and advance their career. But we became so interested in that dynamic, and in particular, what it meant if you don't have social capital, that we asked our data sciences team to dig in and understand uh, what kind of advantage there was. And it turns out, if you apply for a job on LinkedIn and, at the same time, ask for a referral from someone on your network, which we facilitate through a button that we added, 
you are nine times more likely to get the job. Nine times. So then we took it a step further. And we asked that same team to do the analysis to better understand who would be more likely to have a strong enough network to be able to take advantage of that dynamic. And what they found was not altogether surprising, but very much worth mentioning. It turns out that where you grow up, where you go to school, and where you work very much influence the strength of your network. More specifically, if you grow up in a high-income neighborhood, you are three times more likely to have a strong network. If you attend a top university, you are two times more likely to have a strong network. And if you work at a top company, you are two times then again likely to have a strong network. If you benefit from all three of those dynamics, you are 12 times more likely to have a strong network. The kind of network that creates the 9x advantage. But exactly to your question, what if you have the aptitude, what if you have the skills, the growth mindset, the grit, the resilience, the compassion, what if you have those qualities that every company is looking for in terms of superstar talent, but you don't have the network, and you don't have the relationships, and you don't have the social capital? We call that the network gap. And we are very focused on doing everything within our power to help close that gap. There's three ways that we can do that. One is through products, the second is through programs, and the third is through people and empowering individuals. With regard to product, long story short, there are ways in which LinkedIn can facilitate creating social capital for people in underserved communities by virtue of essentially redefining the connection. Not necessarily requiring you to connect with another individual, but if you're affiliated with an organization, say a nonprofit or an NGO that creates economic opportunity for the disadvantaged and the underserved, and there's another individual in that local community who has volunteered to help with that organization, we can make a connection between those two so that the underserved individual can leverage that person who's raised their hand and said they want to help. So that's one thing. So stay tuned for that. There's an effort right now, an initiative that is very high priority for the company and for me personally. So that's one. Two, in terms of programs, there's a number of different ways that organizations and companies can widen and broaden their aperture through which they recruit. And historically, LinkedIn, like a lot of companies in Silicon Valley, used to recruit from a very specific group of companies, or rather colleges and universities, almost taking pride in the exclusiveness. And in retrospect, it is absolutely the wrong dynamic. And so not only do we not limit the recruiting pool from specific prestigious universities, uh, we have actually created programs to help train people with non-traditional backgrounds. So we've created apprenticeships in technology, engineering specifically, recruiting, sales, even leadership uh, that doesn't require uh, a degree or a diploma from a, a four-year university. As a matter of fact, with regard to engineering, as long as you've completed some rudimentary uh, coding boot camp, uh, you can apply to our technology apprenticeship program, which is a bespoke program for each individual ranging from one to three years. And we're seeing fantastic success on that front. And then lastly is something we're really, really excited about. And we call it the plus one pledge. And for as uh, much power as there is uh, with regard to our product and redefining connections and our programs and, and widening the aperture, there's extraordinary scale in terms of helping every individual to recognize the power they have to open doors. And what all of us need to understand is the fact that we are subject to unconscious bias. Despite the best of intentions, that's why it's unconscious. And that 12x dynamic I was referring to earlier with regard to network strength, the people that we typically help and the t people we typically open doors for and that we mentor and that we advise, those are the folks that we grew up with, we went to school with, and we worked with. And there's nothing wrong with helping the people that you care about and that you know. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you decided to take a pledge to help one person, just one, outside of your network, outside of your first degree relationships and connections. Someone that's reached out to you for help who historically maybe you said, I don't know this person. We call that the plus one pledge. And we asked all of our employees at LinkedIn to take that plus one pledge. 
Uh, we gifted uh, all of the employees uh, free premium subscriptions to give to people outside of their networks to help jumpstart that process. 60%, 9,000 of our employees took us up on the offer. And the stories that we heard in terms of the lives that were changed just were extraordinary. So what we're trying to do now is create a global movement around this idea of a plus one pledge where we start creating opportunities for people outside of our network, not at the exclusion of helping the people we care about, but in addition to. That's the plus one. And in doing so, we can help turn some of these vicious cycles into virtuous ones, where you're bringing people who didn't have that opportunity but have all the requisite skills, putting them in a position where they can create opportunities for their connections. So those are some of the things we're working on. Great. Let's have another question. How about here on the front row? Yeah. Very happy to have you here. Uh, my question is, you said when you took over uh, in 2008, you were really excited by the platform and its potential. Mm. Back then, it was really difficult to identify the platform level and its you know, spread, what it is now. So what was one thing that actually made you feel that this was the right thing and this could be taken to these levels? And second part of it, three things which you really faced as challenges or opportunities during this journey in the last decade, uh, and what really scaled so much? Because back in 2008, it would have been really difficult to identify the potential of that particular opportunity. So uh, the second part of the question was challenges that we face as a company or challenges that I faced individually? That you individually faced. Challenge that I have individually faced, okay. So uh, with regard to what I saw, it was, I guess, in part what I saw, but mostly what I heard. And one piece of advice I would give all of you here today when you're thinking about your career path is to make sure you surround yourself with the best people that you can find and to not compromise on that. People with a uh, similar sense of purpose, with similar values. And I think historically people used to think about that in the context of who you work for, and that certainly matters, finding the right boss, the right mentor, et cetera. But it's also the people you work with and the people that work for you. It's the whole 360. And one of the things that I was very fortunate to find when I first joined the company, those 338 people we were talking about earlier, was how extraordinarily talented they were. And Reed and, and uh, my predecessor, a guy named Dan Nye, had done a wonderful job recruiting extraordinary people. And I decided when I first started over the first 100 days or first three months or so, that before I developed a plan, and we developed a plan, and we codified our, our sense of purpose and our culture, our values, et cetera, that I was going to meet everyone at the company. I was just going to listen. And so that's what I did. I didn't have 338 one-on-ones. I had a bunch of one-on-ones and a bunch of brown bag sessions. And I went through and met with everyone. And I just heard what was on their minds, what was working, what wasn't working. And then we did a series of deep dives. And we went deep on the strategy and the roadmap for every business line and every major product line. And it was after that that I sat down with the leadership team and we began to codify what it is that we wanted to accomplish. So you, you, had, you asked, what did I see? It was more what I heard. And paying attention to some very, very talented people and hearing what they thought was possible and what they thought our strengths were and what, where they thought the challenges lied and piecing that together. I've heard, um, I think it was Jack Dorsey, he, uh, the CEO of Twitter, once described the role of the CEO as an editor, like the editor of a newspaper, the editor-in-chief. You have a lot of information flowing, a lot of headlines flowing. You have to figure out the most important ones, and you have to pull together that narrative. And I'm very fortunate in so far as it's not just our objectives, it's not just our what, and it's not just our how in terms of vision, mission, culture, values. It's also about the, the management practices at our company. I, some of the most valuable lessons I've learned are from the people on my team. I'm oftentimes asked, who, who, are the, who has been the greatest influence on my career? Who have I learned the most from? It's the team, my team. And so listening and paying attention, I think, can, can have an enormous impact in terms of crafting and developing that kind of vision or mission. In terms of challenges, I would uh, cite one that I have found to be quite common among CEOs. So when you ask CEOs, the, the biggest 
lesson they learned as a CEO, the biggest challenge they faced, more often than not, uh, they'll tell you, uh, there's probably any baseball fans here, it's cricket, right? It's all cricket. So in American baseball, we're late in the, the playoffs, but in American baseball, we have a pitcher. And in, in cricket, you call it the bowler. bowler. And so in cricket, when the bowler's arm gets tired, is there someone that comes out and, and removes them or switches the bowler? Is that the, 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 yeah. So in America, when a pitcher's arm gets tired, the manager will come out and will ask the pitcher how they're doing. And inevitably, especially if you've got a superstar pitcher on the mound, the pitcher will say, I'm doing fine. My arm's fine. You can go sit down. I'm going to finish this game. But it's not for the pitcher to tell the manager what's going on. It's for the manager to make that decision. And the biggest challenge that I face, the most valuable lesson I learned as a CEO, is uh, to not leave the pitcher in the game for too long. And that can be a very painful lesson because you see someone that's underperforming and you try to rationalize all the reasons they should stay in the job. You don't act out of fear or concern as to whether or not you're going to be able to replace them, whether or not you're sending the wrong signal to the team. A whole litany of uh, things will cross your mind. And the longer a person who's not capable of doing their job is in that role, the more harm that's being done to the company. So it's very important, and we talked about this a little bit earlier with regard to managing compassionately in that situation. Uh, but that's, that's been the most valuable lesson I've learned as a CEO. Great, I think we should have time for one more question, and let's go for the hand in the middle in the aisle that just got, yeah. yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, similar to the Compassion Project you've initiated recently across elementary schools in the US, how do you see the future of LinkedIn with regards to facilitating the journey from education to employment for the next gen workforce, as well as with the rise of non-standard forms of employment? Thank you. Did you mention the Compassion Project, the nonprofit? Oh, thank you so much for mentioning that. That's awesome. So for, for those that don't know, uh, the Compassion Project actually operates outside of LinkedIn. It's a nonprofit. I started uh, with an ed tech company called EverFi. And the mission of the organization is to ensure that compassion is taught in ev every elementary school in the United States. And then hopefully once we are able to establish that, we can start to expand globally. That's something very passionate about, so thank you for mentioning that. And if anyone's interested in learning more about it, it's thecompassionproject.com, very aptly titled URL. Uh, with regard to the role that LinkedIn can play with regard to uh, bridging the divide between uh, education and the workforce, uh, it comes back to the economic graph. And one of the initial use cases that we would cite when talking about the power of the economic graph was a situation when once we've achieved enough scale, we used to talk about the economic graph in its earliest days five, six plus years ago, and so we hadn't yet achieved scale, but now all of these things are happening. But one of the examples we would cite is you could pick any locality anywhere in the world. You could understand within that locality the fastest growing jobs, the skills required to obtain those jobs, the skills in aggregate of the workforce within that locality. You could measure the size of that gap. And when the gap started to grow, and perhaps prohibitively wide, you could then equip all of the education organizations within that locality, vocational training facilities, junior colleges, two-year universities, four-year universities, with this information and with this data. So they, in theory, could create a just-in-time curriculum so that they could start to prepare the workforce for the jobs that are and will be and not just the jobs that once were. And so we're doing that. We're doing that all over the world. We do it with countries. We do it with cities. And it's incredibly exciting. The other thing I would add along those lines, and it, it, it can't just uh, fall to any one company or technology platform like a LinkedIn, uh, but facilitating cooperation between the public sector and the private sector, I think is going to be absolutely essential to realizing what you were talking about. And uh, the German model is a very interesting one along those lines, where you have uh, really strong cooperation between uh, local national government uh, the educational sector and the private sector. So th there are clear examples of where it's working. And I think other countries would do well uh, to start facilitating and aligning shared objectives amongst those three constituencies. All too often, they're trying to do the right thing, but they're working against one another uh, unintentionally. And I think if we can come together and establish uh, clearly aligned objectives, 
then you can start to leverage infrastructure that never existed before, like the economic graph, uh, to start to accelerate change and improvement. In fact, I think we can uh, fit in one more question, and we'll go right over here, the hand that just showed up in the blue. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, LinkedIn's data is special because um, we don't lie on our CVs. So most of the things that we mention on LinkedIn will probably be genuine. And um, therefore, also, obviously, you being acquired by Microsoft is a risk to like the privacy of a lot of people um, that have LinkedIn profiles. So I guess, especially given what we're seeing, for example, through organ transplants, the huge difference between opt-in and opt-out, because a lot of people are not very well informed about um, what's actually going on. Um, could you explain what things um, LinkedIn's data is being used for by Microsoft? And um, yeah, and basically, um, what things uh, you're opting in for and what things you're not opting in for actively. All of the current integrations with Microsoft are opt-in with regard to the exchange of data. Uh, LinkedIn's got six different values. Our, our first value, the most important value, is that our members come first. Our entire ecosystem exists because of our members. And it's interesting because Microsoft takes the privacy of uh, their customers and the individual employees uh, who work for their customers uh, and prioritize that to the same extent we prioritize members first. They do it through a, a different perspective via the enterprise customer. What we realized, and I think Microsoft has been uh, keenly focused on for quite some time now, is that in order to continue to, to reinforce this idea that our members come first, we have to establish trust. And an old friend of mine uh, taught me that trust equals consistency over time. And there's no substitute for either one of those dimensions. So as early as roughly a decade ago, we established first principles with regard to how our members' data would be leveraged by LinkedIn. And there were three first principles at the time. We talked about clarity, we talked about consistency, and we talked about control. Uh, with regard to clarity, it was to be as clear as possible to our members uh, at every turn with regard to how their data was being leveraged to not put it in the fine print, uh, to not bury it in legalese, to make it as intuitive as possible to understand how the data was being leveraged. Uh, second, we wanted to be as consistent as we could with regard to when we were making changes. Uh, whipsawing our membership, uh, changing the, the terms of service constantly, uh, it, there's no faster way to undermine trust than to just make these changes. And again, trust is consistency over time. But perhaps most importantly was this control dynamic, and that's the, the answer to your question, uh, which is any time we are going to be leveraging a member's data, we want to be very, very clear with them with regard to what's happening, and uh, to the best of our ability, provide them the control. So if they don't want the data to be leveraged like that, to be able to opt out, and for things like Microsoft integration, to opt into that. So that's the approach that we've taken. Great. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I really enjoyed that. Could everyone please join me in thanking Jeff Winner?